about today <clears throat> was very fitting for this subject. You talked about real religion, real spirituality, that many of the institutions, many of the churches that are out there, not just churches, but also other religions, Islam, um, other world religions, Judaism as well, they, they tend to have inner core groups within them, oftentimes connected to the state or foreign actors that utilize the religious group or the religious organization as a form of soft power or a tool of state control. I like to call this institutional capture. Uh, I don't mean that every institution in the world is captured. I don't mean that every institution is subversive or is controlled uh, necessarily, but certain institutions have been penetrated for a long time. And I don't just mean penetrated like Klaus's cabinets. I mean penetrated by non-state actors, NGOs, foundations, intelligence agents. And the best example of this is, no, uh, well, we could talk about the Vatican itself as a global intelligence agency, so to speak. That's what it's called in the intelligence literature. I'm not saying that every individual Roman Catholic is bad or part of a vast conspiracy. I'm saying that a lot of institutions are corrupted based on the structure of the institution. So sometimes an institution can be corrupted from the top down if it's a <clears throat> very top down structure. And of course, after Vatican I, the, Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church becomes a very top down structure. <clears throat> other institutions can be co opted in other ways, like particularly just money. There is ideological compromise, uh, there is uh, sexual compromise. There's also ego, so a lot of different techniques. The acronym is MICE, M-I-C-E, that's typically used for how people can be co-opted and compromised. And this is no, it's not a purely state thing. So we think of uh, politicians, presidents, we think of world leaders being in the past assassinated or <clears throat> maybe compromised because they had pictures of them at uh, Epstein Island or pictures of them at uh, a whorehouse or something like this, right? If you watch The Godfather uh, in the second Godfather, you notice that the family compromises a local politician who won't pass laws that are amenable to the family's uh, gambling enterprises. And so they compromise him when he visits one of the Corleone whorehouses. Now, <clears throat> that's a classic technique. There's nothing new about espionage and compromise in that way. But we always think of this as thing that goes on in the state sphere. But in reality, this goes on in all spheres because of power relations. So if you're a government entity, for example, you want to use, even if you don't totally control, you want to you want to steer or manipulate various institutions within your domain, within your country, within your jurisdiction <clears throat> to go along with your power or your soft power. So the reason that religion matters in the global sphere of geopolitics and espionage and power relations is that religion is one of the key elements of controlling perception, telling people where to, to look, what to believe, to base their lives around. And so to control religion has always been uh, an unquenchable desire on the part of the state. You go back to early Christianity, for example, the church was uh, uh, wanting, it wanted to be, co the, the, the state wanted to co-opt the early church to teach various forms of Christianity that would make the state God. You had Aryan emperors, for example, uh, in the fourth century that wanted to turn the church into an Aryan institution. You had other emperors later on who wanted to make it an institution that really in, in, in practice just submitted to the emperor or the state. Ancient empires, they did the same thing where the emperor's the God. And <clears throat> this idea though of spheres of power and limitations to power, this typically comes out of Western law theory, the Bible, Mosaic law, biblical law, uh, Christian canon law, and so forth. These heritage traditions that we have in the West help us to protect and set up boundaries. And when we talk, when we come back, we're going to talk more about that with institutional capture on the Alex Jones Show. Welcome back to the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show. I'm your guest host, Jay Dyer. We're talking about institutional capture. We're talking about <laughs> the heritage of the West and Western civilization. And the laws and limitations and firewalls that are in place, ultimately to try to protect our basic values, our basic institutions, <clears throat> and our ways of life. And religion plays a key role in that. It might not be as important in the modern day as it was 
500, 600, 1,000 years ago, but it still plays a key role. <clears throat> and there's no better way to understand this notion of institutional capture than to go back to really the World War II period. Now, obviously, there was institutional capture or attempts at that prior to World War II. When we get into the history of British intelligence and the networks that British intelligence used in the Freemasonic lodges throughout the UK, throughout the empire, as their intelligence operative network, right? So that's what the lodges functioned as. And by the time that we get to the 20th century, particularly right after World War II, <clears throat> the beginning of the OSS, and I'm talking about this because there was a great book that recently came out from an academic. This is not a conspiracy book, not a book that claims that the whole world is run by Jesuits or anything like that, although the Jesuits do have a long time close connection to the Central Intelligence Agency, particularly, particularly at the time of Vatican II in connection to people like John Courtney Murray. But this book that came out recently called Aaron into the Wilderness, and it's about the uh, history of the relationship between the CIA uh, and religion. And the early chapters really focus on key characters like Wild Bill Donovan, the first uh, sort of leader and head, the American James Bond, some called him, who was the first head of the OSS, uh, the, the, the predecessor to the CIA in 1942. And so when FDR put uh, Donovan in, Donovan had some of these ideas that, quote, religion is the key to OSS and CIA, CIA manipulation. So immediately after World War II, Donovan went into uh, meetings with the Vatican, meetings with uh, the papacy at that time to recruit uh, as much of the Vatican appar apparatchiks as he could into the post-war efforts uh, after World War II and then into the Cold War. So to really make the uh, Roman Catholic institution not just against communism, which I think makes perfect sense. Anybody who's religious would be a natural uh, ally against atheism and Sovietism and communism. But the problem is that Donovan and then his successors there at the agency, people like Ed Lansdale and others, uh, Lansdale, I don't think it wasn't a Catholic, but many others who were in the agency uh, people like William Casey, William Colby, they were, of course, pretty devout traditional Catholics. And I'm not faulting them for wanting to oppose communism. But the, the problem is that, and this was really the brainchild of Donovan and then, and then Lansdale, was that if the CIA could really embed and get its tentacles into the Vatican, then the Vatican would no longer really be an institution that functioned as something outside of the sphere of American influence and American soft power. So what happened is that, and this this book, again, from academia, uh, Michael Graziano, Aaron into the Wilderness, Religion and the History of the CIA, details the means and methods and tricks that were used to get into and to really, in a way, uh, steer. I wouldn't say totally control, but to really make sure that the papacy, the Vatican, which is the central, you know, most a uh, populous form of Christianity, what we call Christianity in the modern world. Obviously, they saw it as not just a natural ally in the Cold War against atheism, but a, a, a very powerful institu institution to try to control and steer. And so if they could do that, uh, they would have the ability then to turn that institution to any of America's goals in any future conflicts. And if people are looking to try to understand well, what's going on with the Vatican and this kind of stuff nowadays, well, many writers uh, outside of Catholicism, even within Catholicism, people like David Wemhoff, have talked about the fact that the odd actions, uh, not just of the post-Vatican II post, but of Pope Francis in supporting the World Economic Forum's agendas, supporting outright extreme versions of globalization and uh, calling for a world economic authority, calling for more power and authority to the United Nations and supporting UNESCO, and now moving towards the blessing of uh, gay unions and so forth. It makes perfect sense when we understand this post World War II, post Cold War, or during the Cold War, uh, embedding. And <clears throat> uh, Donovan even used the terminology of making alliances that would then allow manipulation on the part of Western intelligence agencies. And it's not just the CIA. Remember, the CIA was really established by British intelligence. So this is really all Western intelligence, so to speak, in a loose sense, the five eyes and so forth, <clears throat> really having the ability to tell institutions like the Vatican, you're gonna go along with this. And if you don't, 
well, maybe some of those pictures of the Cardinals and other people involved in, uh, you know, Vatican orgies, which has all come out uh, in mainstream news, by the way, maybe more of that comes out. Maybe more of this uh, pedophilia stuff comes out. So you see the blackmail is a key element to this. And a lot of intelligence writers have pointed out that blackmail, if you just look at the Cold War, both sides of the Cold War were very interested in having dirt and blackmail on clerics. The KGB would famously blackmail many clerics in the Vatican. And you can read both sides of the conflict. You can read uh, uh, writers who have a more pro-Soviet and pro-liberal uh, bent in the Cold War. They'll say the same thing as writers that are more uh, Cold Warrior, more neocon about the Cold War. They'll say the exact same thing. So it's not even controversial. We know that, for example, when the Soviets took over Russia, they did the same kind of model. They would have uh, tiers, and I've interviewed experts on this uh, on my YouTube channel. They would have tiers of which clerics were not compromisable, maybe compromisable, compromised, and so forth. They would structure them, and so it wasn't all black and white, like, oh, the whole church was KGB, or did the KGB take over the Vatican? Well, there were periods when the KGB had some dirt and some influence in the Vatican, but never really took it over. In fact, John Paul II really solidified the union of the CIA and the Vatican at the close of the Cold War. And then John Paul II played a key role working with uh, the, the director of the CIA, Kissinger and others, many, many meetings there. And so there's this long history. Now I've gone into a lot of detail with Operation Gladio, where we have the alliance of the CIA's Black Operations Division <clears throat> with the Vatican Bank and using that as a means, as a secret bank to funnel a lot of money to uh, black ops using things like Opus Dei, according to Paul Williams and his Operation Gladio. But I'm not going to rehearse all the Gladio stuff. But the point is <clears throat> that the goal was to make the religious entity a tool of American soft power. So that puts the church at the behest and the control of the state. And to be more precise, not Joe Biden that's calling the shots, right? It's the deep state. It's the shadow government the cryptocracy that's really calling the shots. And that's what now mainline academia and multiple books on the history of intelligence analysis are now admitting and coming forth with. For example, we had OSS operative Father Felix Morleon, who played a key role in Gladio, was instrumental in promoting ecumenism, the idea that the religion should come together and form a kind of a generic one world religion. Bill Donovan himself was a huge promoter of ecumenism very early on, attended tons of interreligious gatherings, promoting the idea that all the religions have a common bond. <clears throat> Why do I talk about this? Well, <clears throat> ecumenism, this idea that all the religions should just sort of come together and just sort of find a lowest common denominator religion that's a supra religion to unite around, is itself basically an OSS CIA supported project. Now, it had support and money earlier on than that, the late 1800s, 1890s, not even somewhere in there, in 1895, I think, the Chicago World Conference, we had uh, <clears throat> different yogis coming and speaking at the World Conference of uh, uh, the Chicago World Conference. And then <clears throat> the Rockefellers particularly were impressed by, I think it was Swami Vivekananda or somebody like that. And, and the reason that Rockefeller <clears throat> back in the turn of the century found this to be so impressive was that he saw it as a way to capitalize on religion as a tool of American soft power. So if you could align Americanism with sort of Rockefeller ideology and Rockefeller ideas of sort of neoliberalism, and to then make the religion conform to a lowest common denominator consumerist ideology, now you have a perfect tool for soft power. Remember, soft power is utilizing means that aren't kinetic warfare, that aren't outright battle to project power through things like entertainment, pop culture, music, Hollywood. Those are all forms of soft power. And this is very well known. You can go read, uh, I think, Joseph Nye, people from the Kennedy School of Government, uh, Harvard, and so the many famous classic articles about exerting soft power. It's a, it's a part of modern warfare. And this gets into fourth, fifth generational warfare and all that. But <clears throat> the religious element, is something that was pioneered by the OSS and CIA, utilizing religion on the part of intelligence operations, particularly 
not just the classic stuff of spying on somebody and getting dirt, but compromising people. And I, I suspect this plays a big role in the step down of Pope Benedict XVI some years back and the ascension of the first Jesuit Pope. Remember the Jesuits play a key role here because of course, Jesuit universities like Fordham, Georgetown, others, right? These are classic um, intelligence connected universities. And those intelligence connected universities, for example, uh, Fordham and others played a key role in preparing for the coup in Ukraine, the Maidan coup through religious dissension and religious revolution. And they did that by setting up an entirely concocted CIA church in the Ukraine, contrary to and in, in division from the already existing accepted canonical Orthodox Church. In fact, the Patriarch of Constantinople prior to all this conflict already accepted <laughs> the canonical Orthodox Church there. But then for the purposes of the war, the division had to be fomented there religiously, ideologically, that preceded and then also continued into the actual Maidan coup in 2014. <clears throat> and that was all part of this larger strategic battle of neocons versus Putin. In fact, we just had Alex talking the, uh, today about the article that came out about how the CIA was involved in supporting and having bases in the Ukraine. Well, of course they did. But it wasn't just that, it was also there to exert religious soft power through the institutions and universities, often connected to American Jesuit and Catholic universities, to push and to foment the very same things that have been going on in these countries all the way back to World War II and Bill Donovan. Now, Bill Donovan is not the only one. In fact, Bill Donovan had intimate close connections to Francis Cardinal Spellman and Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Other writers like David Wimhoff, as well as now <coughs> mainline academics have pointed out that these people were working directly with Bill Donovan. In fact, Bishop Fulton Sheen was helping to recruit people for the OSS. He would send recruits to Bill Donovan, who would be potentially good uh, assets and agents. Now, I'm not focusing on just the Vatican to make Catholics mad or something like that, because the same thing happens, as I just said, in the Orthodox Church. And it extends to the Protestant world. The Rockefeller family, for example, put tons and tons of millions of dollars throughout the 20th century into Protestant educational institutions to co-opt, subvert, and steer those religious educational entities. In fact, at times they even created seminaries. I think Union Seminary is a Rockefeller creation. And it doesn't just stop there because the Rockefellers were also involved in utilizing Protestant missionaries to go and find ripe areas for exploitation of oil and resources in Latin and South America. Now, there's a whole book on this called Thy Will Be Done. And I'm not saying that all missionaries are bad, they're all or they're all part of this big giant conspiracy. Most missionaries don't have any idea. They're well-meaning, they're well-intentioned, but some missionaries are a, uh, that's a classic cover for intelligence operations just like USAID is a classic cover, just like being a journalist is a classic cover. And in fact, even religious entities have been uh, classically covered for not just espionage, but <laughs> weapons trafficking, money laundering, all the craziest things you could think of have at times utilized religion, churches, international aid entities for the purpose of cutouts. So sometimes those are cutouts. <clears throat> And it gets pretty sophisticated because I'll give you an example. The OSS suggested, as one example, uh, according to Graziano, that the Vatican should participate. Now, the Vatican and, and nobody went with, went for this, but this gives you an idea of the kind of thing that was suggested. <clears throat> the OSS would poison Hitler and Mussolini, causing them to become blind. <clears throat> the Pope would then come on the radio and announce that God had cursed the enemies of the world. West and the, and the allied forces, and this was a divine sign. Now they pushed and they wanted either, Pi I think Pius XII is who they're talking about this time, <clears throat> but nobody went for this. But this gives you an idea. Another plan that they uh, came up with, which was wild according to Graziano, was that Ed Lansdale proposed that in Cuba, the CIA should stage a second coming of Christ. Did you not? It's actually dealt with in the book. <laughs> There's a whole chapter on this, <clears throat> the chapter on Ed Lansdale. Um, who was the successor, you could say, to 
mastering the usage of religious ideology by the OSS and CIA. So you have Donovan really pioneering the idea and then uh, Lansdale into the Cold War really perfecting it with a, a lot of uh, in, uh, finesse, you could say. But <clears throat> Lansdale came up with the idea, well, if we wanted to turn simplistic, superstitious Catholics in Cuba against Castro, the best way to do this would be to, and he doesn't say how, or this came out, I think, in the church committee hearings. We don't know exactly how this would go down, but the idea was we'll stage a second coming of Jesus. Jesus will in some way tell everyone that Castro is the Antichrist. This would then flip Cuba over to the side of America in the Cold War. Now, that's just one example, right? And this book goes into countless examples. For example, in World War II, the OSS. Uh, worked closely with a lot of Muslims to try to foment Islamic opposition to Japan. And the way they did this was come up with all kinds of uh, uh, banners and flags that would portray Japan and the, the Axis power of Japan as a pagan entity that wanted to destroy and suppress Islam, even though actually the Axis pow uh, powers typically had a good relationship with Islam. Now, I'm not pro-Islam. I'm not saying the Axis were the great heroes. I'm just pointing out that the techniques here of religious subversion, you're starting, you'll notice a pattern here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> likewise, Ansdale, who had studied Buddhism and studied uh, Asian religions very intently, that was sort of his focus. Lansdale uh, came up with this idea in the Philippines that you could... Uh, play on the local superstitions by creating staged events like chupacabras and vampires. I'm not joking. <laughs> so like, <laughs> Jamie's in there laughing. So chupacabras are basically a CIA operation. <laughs> so, I mean, not really, but sort of. Now, in the case of the Philippines, Lansdale came with the idea of utilizing the local superstitions about vampires to <clears throat> hang up the hooks, the hook rebellion, and the CIA was worried that the hook rebellion would side with communism, even though they weren't technically communist. They worried that it might flip over to a communist government. So what the CIA did was <clears throat> grab a bunch of dead bodies, drain them of blood, poke two holes in the neck to make it look like they had been drained by some vampire or chupacabra. So uh, this actually worked because it scared the locals into siding with, because they, they ran the propaganda that, right, that, that this was a sign to side with the pro-CIA government in the Philippines, and it ended up working. And it, it helped to shut down the hook, uh, hook rebellion. Now, that same idea of utilizing a lot of these symbols, another thing that they would do is that they would send soldiers into the hook camps, and they would paint all-seeing eyes everywhere. Now, this was Lansdale's idea because there was a superstition in a lot of places about the eye of God. And the eye of God, if it was there, it was an omen, and maybe the the demons or the entities that put it there to curse you or something like that. So utilizing superstition, utilizing curses. And guess what? This same principle, where does Lansdale go right after this? Directly into Vietnam to consult, I think, for seven or eight years in Vietnam. Phoenix program time. And what do we get? According to Douglas Valentine, the exact same technique of draining bodies, uh, uh, the, the same type of you know grotesque things. We're weaponizing serial killers, weaponizing uh, these really outlandish and outrageous macabre displays of bodies that were decapitated and had, you know, the kind of stuff that like cartels do, right? That's ex that, that's just Phoenix program stuff. <clears throat> now, there's no end to this. It gets even crazier because there was even an absurd plan that <clears throat> the Roman Catholic priest, Father John Island Gallery, together with Ed Lansdale, proposed to Donald Rumsfeld in the late 70s. And this was a plan to rebuild the city, the ancient city of Ephesus, with all of its churches and synagogues. And this would be a way to promote a new ecumenist religion uh, uh, in the region for the purposes of what was called the NATO Peace Project. So literally, the NATO Peace Project was going to rebuild <laughs> Ephesus and then this would somehow lead to everybody in the region coming into one world religion stuff, right? And so again, what this book highlights, and this is not written by a person who was a um, proponent of any religion I'm aware of, 
just an academic. But he's pointing out the usage of all of these tricks, techniques, and tactics that the intelligence agencies, particularly here of the West, would utilize on a grand scale at times. These are just the, there's plenty of examples that they did use. They did use the Muslims, for example, against uh, Japan. They did use uh, cannibals and, and serial killer type stuff against the Viet Cong <coughs> in Vietnam, Phoenix program. So those things are real. They did propose a, a staged second coming, but that was not actually executed or done. Some of these wild stories and wild plans didn't actually come to fruition, but the wild stories and plans give you an idea of the type of things that they are engaged in. That's my point. So would it really seem strange that there might be a staged UFO alien encounter or disclosure? Of course not. I mean, if they're talking around batting around the idea of staging a second coming, of course they batted around and have in the cards the idea of promoting a fake and stage, a fake and gay alien invasion, fake and gay alien. Right? Of course, part and parcel. So the point is that ecumenism is a Cold War tool. In fact, one of the key elements that we might think about in terms of ecumenism is the idea of Jungian philosophy, Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, of course, is well known for the ideas of archetypes and kind of rebranding ancient Platonic ideas into a way to decode psychology and dream analysis and all of this, right, as the successor to uh, to Freud's psychoanalysis. <clears throat> so Carl Jung is very famous, and, and people like Jordan Peterson today are kind of a reinstantiation of the a lot of the Jungian ideas, not saying everything, but, um, you know, he's in that tradition. And what do we get <clears throat> with Carl Jung? Did you know that Carl Jung worked closely with the OSS? In fact, he was called Agent 488. Agent 488, that was Carl Jung's number as a secret OSS operative and informant. That's public information. So even people like Carl Jung were there. And why was Carl Jung so useful? According to Graziano, archetypes and control. And I was talking about Carl Jung and his agent name as Agent 488 in the OSS. And you can read uh, letters and transcripts and cables between Dulles, Alan Dulles and uh, uh, Carl Jung discussing his uh, informing and his, dis and this is relevant for one, because a lot of people thought, well, Carl Jung uh, must have been a Nazi because of his philosophy and uh, different ideas that he put forth. And by the way, I'm not saying that everything about archetypes is wrong. I I've read a good bit of Carl Jung and I've read <clears throat> a lot on the notions of archetypes in literature and in psychology and philosophy. So there's a lot there. I think it's a very profound insight, but it also can be used as a way to turn people away from things like Christianity or from Jesus and into this idea that, well, all the religions are just kind of masks of the one overriding super religion that we're all in the process of discovering. And so one of the things that is a presupposition of the ecumenist movement that, again, the CIA has fostered from the time of Bill Donovan all the way up through Vatican II and the Vatican II documents, which really absolutely just blew up ecumenism throughout the world post-Vatican II. It's the Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church, and its liberalization. <clears throat> it's necessary for where we got to today in terms of the uh, religious world and the promotion of ecumenism. Now we see, for example, uh, Pope Francis promoting the idea of a, uh, a weird three cubes building in, uh, I think, Abu Dhabi called the is the 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 monotheistic faith, so the Abrahamic faith center, where all the world religions that are monotheistic now can come together and worship these big, weird energy cubes or something. I mean, literally, if you watch the video, it's like, you know, uh, Autobots, <laughs> right? Uh, Nathaniel Witwicky, come worship me at the apostate world center. That's my Optimus Prime. That's here because they've got these cubes. If you watch the video where they're bringing these cubes of light and it's like three cubes, it looks like the energy cubes from Transformers. Very bizarre, very weird stuff. But that's part of the ecumenist uh, model of steering everything into one giant world religion. Now, where, we, where do we get these ideas from? It's not directly, as we said, from Christianity, obviously. Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. There we go. There's the, the erection of the center. And one of the videos promoting this uh, weird uh, international faith center is a video where these where three kids, uh, a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian, and there's the 
Pope Francis signing the declaration of this new entity together with the world religions and various, the, the imam there together to say, that, oh, God wants all the world religions to be there in this, this new world religion. That was their declaration that they signed. This is all obviously a project with tons of money put into it. I mean, this doesn't come together from nowhere. This is for this is from the top down, you see. And so there's a there's a quote church which looks nothing like a church. I don't think there's even is there even a cross in there. I mean, it looks like you know a big giant concrete Soviet brutalist architecture, you know, squares everywhere. It looks it, it, it looks like a nightmare, right? Like like parking garages. Do you want to have church in a parking garage? <clears throat> um, but that's on purpose, by the way, because. You'll notice the change in aesthetics uh, in these weird world religion temples that they're building. Um, there is no aesthetic. The aesthetic is ugly, brutalism, just bizarre concrete boxes. Again, that's all Soviet stuff. You think, well, but, but isn't isn't a world religion? Isn't that a KGB communist Soviet thing? No, no. Ultimately, it's a Western funded thing. So here's this so-called church. Uh, doesn't even recognizably look like a church. Um, yeah, just hideous, and but it's hideous on purpose. And notice there's not even a cross in there, <laughs> so it's like a maybe up the one little tiny one over there. Uh, it's like a Unitarian uh, uh, Universalist type of of structure. So very little to do with Christianity in this whole thing, and really it's a Christ, quote Christianity that then melds with the fake world religion now. Where do we get this idea of a fake world religion? We talked about the money that's put into it uh, with uh, the funding that came through Rockefeller money for co-opting the Protestant institutions in the in the U.S. But there's also money <clears throat> that and, and influence that went into funding British thinkers and structures, Royal Society and so forth, where Aldous Huxley, for example, uh, long, long ago wrote a book about called the perennial, about this called the perennial philosophy. Um, a lot of people don't technically call him a perennialist, but in that book, he talked about the future world religion, and he was writing very uh, in, in a lot of uh, synonymity with his uh, cohort, H.G. Wells, who wrote a book before that called God the Invisible King. So in God the Invisible King, H.G. Wells said, we're going to create a fake world religion. And it'll really be a cloak or a cover for our inner scientism controlled New World Order cult, but it'll have the trappings of whatever religion you want in the exterior. <clears throat> so a few decades later, Huxley writes perennial philosophy and has his drug experiences and comes to the realization that, uh, well, well, of course, I've seen, I've seen all reality is one. Uh, when you take the drug, this is, see, of course, all reality, all reality is one. So he has this mystical experience of monism. All oh, reality is one, dude. <clears throat> now he's hanging out with a famous character you might have heard of partying and doing acid with Aleister Crowley. And there's a great book by Dr. Richard Spence called Secret Agent 666, Aleister Crowley, British Intelligence and the Occult. And what Spence argues is that probably Huxley got the ideas for MKUltra from Aleister Crowley's previous drug diaries. So Crowley wrote these drug diaries where he was recording the experiences of himself and other people on various drugs. And then Huxley, presumably according to the thesis of Spence, saw this. He'd been partying and doing who knows what but stuff with Crowley. <clears throat> and they came up with the idea, why don't we use this for some kind of project? And so the British version via Tavistock and other entities of what would become MKUltra in America was born. And so you had two, two sides of the Atlantic basically engaged in the same research and study about controlling and mastering not just uh, not just the exterior domain of the uh, you know full spectrum dominance, but mastering the inner domain, the mind, psi war, mind war, etc. This literally comes directly out of the occult studies of British intelligent asset Aleister Crowley and his idea of a new satanic aeon that would that would emerge uh, in our day. So I'm not saying that everybody in the establishment is a Crowley. I'm just giving one example of how religion, <clears throat> not just the traditional religions of the West, of Judaism and Islam and Christianity, but religion that's even fringe, weird cults, satanic groups, sects, are also part of this overall structure for experimentation, to study mind control, 
we all know probably of the longtime connection between the CIA and Scientology. This is partly why other countries like Russia have banned entities like Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientology because they are often used as cutouts and covers for espionage. We read and talked about in the Johan Ratio book and his history of Fabianism, how when the Fabians came to power and got a lot of influence in Britain in the late 1890s, 1910s, 20s, 30s, they really pushed, especially through people like Bertrand Russell, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, the Islamicization of the UK first. And the way they did that was not to bring in a bunch of Wahhabis, which was really a Muslim Brotherhood uh, British intelligence operation to begin with, but they actually brought in Sufis. And Sufis are mystical Islam, kind of pan-religious, archetypal Jungian Islam. That prepared the way then for decades later where we are now of Londonistan with giant uh, Islamic population now being imported into the UK. That was by design, and that was the test bed and the first dry run for then the rest of Europe becoming Islamicized by design. It would say Fabian plan, there's an entire chapter on the Fabians talking about it, because they said, we will use Islam as a means to bring in the one world socialist order. Doesn't matter whether Islam is socialist or not, that, that, that was the point. The point was it's a tool, it's a piece of the puzzle, it's a step to getting to the final goal. Final goal being, as we said, down the road, the eventual one world government, one world religion. All of these entities talk about this and they're steers religious institutions as a very important, crucial part of soft power. To control and manage perception, as Henry Kissinger said, is more important than the facts. So controlling how people perceive the facts, way more important than the facts. And so you can see why religious institutions have to be steered, co-opted, controlled, managed. And that's all part of the long-term global game plan we we're talking about. Huxley, uh, the, the drug diaries of Crowley, <clears throat> how this formed a basis for the idea of <clears throat> co-opting and giving the world a new, co-opting existing religions, <clears throat> giving a new religion. <clears throat> In fact, the last chapter of uh, <clears throat> Doors of Perception, Huxley says that we could uh, experiment with mass drugging of the populace and then maybe something like a kind of a, a quasi new agey type of religion. So the new age movement is a classic example of this. Huxley says that that could be a type of future world religion where all the religions are basically blended into one. Oh, they're all saying the exact same thing, which by the way is a contradiction. Uh, all the world religions are not saying the same thing. Uh, you know, Some of them are exclusive, right? So if you're an exclusivist religion, where you think that that's the only way, well, then you're not the same as the religions that are not exclusivist, right? This is a very basic, obvious contradiction behind or involved in the idea that all the religions are basically, quote, saying the same thing. But it's very useful for the extension of throughout, as we said, the Cold War, Americanism and American soft power to make sure that entities like the Vatican, entities like the Roman Catholic Church, Entities like, or excuse me, uh, that's the same, but entities like the Protestant Church and even the Orthodox Church signed on to and became a part of the, uh, the intelligence establishment's projected goals and power. <clears throat> but that was a stage that was successful in many ways. Now we're at a new stage where the push is the next phase, the next level of extending beyond what we saw at. Uh, you know, Vatican II with its ecumenism or the uh, the push for one world religion that's been going on throughout the 20th century. Now we're at this phase where it's kind of blending into an actual thing that's manifesting in real time and space, this very uh, it, it faith center that you're seeing here. Now, one good positive sign of this is that the a lot of people don't really like this, right? Because this watering down, it really kind of makes the religions irrelevant and they're not really able to provide the healing and, and the, the, because they don't have the power, they're just sort of outward manifestations of various ideologies. And they're so watered down that it's not really offering much. And so the good news is that when these uh, religious uh, institutions adopt the sterilization philosophy that they inevitably do, and you could look, for example, at various Protestant denominations that adopted wholesale liberal ideology, and then 
for example, um, gay marriage, things like that, those institutions, uh, women, priests, and bishops, quote unquote, those institutions end up gradually withering away and dying because they've adopted an anti-male, anti-patriarchal death cult ideology. And they eventually literally end up pushing things like euthanasia, uh, popula uh, population control, depopulation, et cetera. They believe in those ideas, even pro-abortion, all of which are elements of sterility. And so they end up withering and dying. So that's a positive element to this, which is that as people have even noted, uh, Pew Research studies and so forth, the only elements of societies, particularly in the West, that are growing population-wise are people with religious commitments. And we're speaking here of more traditional religious commitments, not weird new age yoga chicks and stuff like that. No, actual religious beliefs that they adhere to and live by because they have families and they have children. They have extended families. And what's pushed by the establishment doesn't just undercut theology and dogma. It actually undercuts human life itself, right? Because you can't cut off how to live in life from the source of living in life, God, who is life itself, right? Life himself. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. So you can't divorce yourself from that and then expect to have anything but death, sterility, decay, and withering away. So that's the good news. The good news is that those entities eventually kind of wither away and die. And you can see this in the liberal Protestant denominations, their memberships, their populations dropping. And in fact, for example, post Vatican II, many, many studies have come out that the Roman Catholic world, after its adoption and dogmatization of liberalism of Vatican II, its seminaries, its countries and populations, its priests, its religious dropping, religious attendance. For example, Europe, Roman Catholic Church religious attendance in Europe, dropping, bottomed out post Vatican II. Other churches, Orthodox Church, growing. Why is that? Because once you adopt these principles, you're adopting death. When you adopt the ideology of the death cult, doesn't matter what costumes you wear, doesn't matter what lesbian bishops put on their costumes, like you're not that <laughs> any more than if I put on a, a basketball jersey, like I'm now, oh, I'm a pro basketball player, I'm wearing the jersey. No, it's just a costume. So if you don't have the, the power, if you don't have the thing itself, the externals don't matter. I'm not saying externals never matter, but externals don't matter as much as the internal. That's what really matters. And then the externals are supposed to reflect the internal. So they're both good, but the internal is obviously more important. But the real danger, I think, is <clears throat> not understanding that authentic religion, authentic spirituality, authentic Christianity, for example, is not going to be found in any of these institutions that are openly funded and promoted by the existing establishment. And it tries to put its tentacles into every one of these. So even mega churches, even if you're in some Protestant independent thing, a lot of those can still be infected by uh, the power structure and influenced by uh, various ideological subversions. So it's a very difficult time. I really appreciate what Alex said in the first hour. It was a very good exposition of the basics about how we really have to find our sense of right and wrong, our basic morality, our the Ten Commandments, right? This kind of stuff. These are the basics we start with. And like Joe Rogan was even saying, like it's looking like things are getting so crazy. Even Joe Rogan saying, hey, maybe it's time to look at Jesus. Maybe it's time to look at the idea of the Ten Commandments. Because you know, societies that are based around things like the Ten Commandments, man, they sure do seem to work and flourish a lot better than the societies that don't have it. Because the societies that don't have it, you're just a cog in the system. You don't have, quote, rights, or you don't have value or human dignity because in those systems and those ideologies, you're not made in the image of God. You're not a reflection of the divine. You're just a cog in the system. You're just a meaningless manifestation of muck, a pawn scum although a little bit more evolved. But by the way, you're also told that you're a god and they're gonna download you in a computer and uh, you'll evolve into becoming some sort of neo-gnostic techno deity in the future. No, it's all lies. You're not gonna be downloaded into a computer. 
Okay, no, Yuval Harari, Klaus, all those people, they're lying to you. And when they, t they even lie to your face and contradict themselves by saying that there's no such thing as consciousness, there's no such thing as free will, but by the way, we'll upload your consciousness to the cloud. Well, how are you gonna upload something that you just said doesn't exist? You see, so that they're just lying, they're, they're, con they're sales pitch men, that's all that is. The reality is that we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. And now that things are getting really crazy, people are starting to see that, hey, wow, looks like actual demon goblins are being let loose on the population. Population is becoming channels for those demons and goblins. People are becoming more and more possessed. I think I've done multiple fourth hours here uh, on the Alex Jones Show saying that it looks like more and more individuals are becoming possessed. There's a great Orthodox Christian article called How a Nation Becomes Possessed. And they're writing about what happened when the communist revolution took over uh, Russia. And there was, a, uh, I think, a Christian bishop at the time who was writing about it. And he was saying that the experience, the manifestation was so wild that it's almost like the whole, not literally the whole country, but, uh, but a large portion of the country became demonized to this bizarre delusion. And it's exactly what we see today with the bizarre delusions that people in America, the ones that are dumbed down, the ones that are, you know, don't have any moral compass, don't have any uh, inclination to seek the truth or to, to know God and so forth, they're being given over, it would seem, as Paul says, to a delusion. And so they're buying into the wildest things, the wildest ideologies. This is the option. I just want to remind you that I'll be in uh, Los Angeles with Jamie Kennedy, the uh, great comedian from Scream, Jamie Kennedy Experiment, and so forth. Uh, March 15th, if you go to my Twitter, you will see at the top the link. Get your tickets March 15th to come see us. Five hours of lectures on all the stuff that you've heard today and more. Also, you can get my red book at my website in the shop, 